The geriatric approach accepts certain principles are universal. This includes an understanding that this is a complex field, the commonality of multiple health problems, and understanding that interactions of multimorbidity are greater than the sum of their parts. Prevalence of cognitive impairment makes geriatrics a field of great complexity. The importance of interactions and relationships is another important feature for geriatric care. This includes interactions with healthcare providers and social supports and networks. Care for the frail older adult must be done with these supports involved whenever possible. A focus on function is essential for geriatric care. Assessment of function yields important information about health status and is crucial in steering intervention and treatment decisions. A multidimensional approach with multidisciplinary assessment and intervention is important as all aspects of health are intricately linked. Good care cannot be provided by looking only at one aspect of somebody's health. Here are a couple of case presentations that illustrate some geriatric principles. So the first one is a case actually, a true case. So it's a 64 year old guy living in a house with his wife. He's got a daughter in the city. He's got a past history of type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease, vascular dementia, triple A, depressive symptoms and falls. So he was attending the day hospital for attention to his cognition, working on his falls and uh, attention to his mood because his mood was also quite low. And he was admitted with unstable angina in the CCU and had three vessel disease on angiography. And his wife phoned in one day to say he can't make it for the day hospital appointment because he's going for cabbage. So if you told that story to somebody walking down the street or sitting in the donut shop across the street, what would they say? <laughs> they'd say, they'd be, right. Exactly, they'd be say, they, they'd say, this guy can't walk, he can't think, he's sad, uh, and he, he's functionally impaired, right? And that's crazy. So that's what we said. I mean, you know, we said, you know, he's dependent on all of his IDLs. He can only feed himself and transfer himself, that's all he can do. And he can only walk with a walker for three meters on a good day before he gets short of breath. So I wrote a letter and his family doctor wrote a letter um, saying that's nuts and we went up and wrote in the chart saying that's nuts, this is totally insane. Um, and they basically said <laughs> get lost, went ahead and did the cabbage. So he was delirious for 16 weeks and he never did recover so he remained with ongoing cognitive loss. He had marked functional impairment, he was being tube fed for a bit of the time, had trouble actually feeding himself. Um, and then we were asked to see him for post-op rehab. So I think the key teaching point is that functional status, cognition, and uh, attention to mood and psychosocial situations are actually critically important. Let's look at another case study which highlights the principles of geriatric assessment. Mr. O was a 90-year-old man living alone in the core area of the city with no family or home care. He was admitted to the emergency room with a fractured pelvis and subsequently admitted to a medical unit. He felt well until three days prior to the admission, at which point he was experiencing decreased energy and fatigue. He was ambulating less and had fallen three times in the four days before the admission. He stopped cooking, cleaning and going out, and then he fell and could not get up. Looking at Mr. O's past history, he was a heavy smoker with questionable COPD. He had considerable alcohol intake, but no medical complications. Looking at his previous function, he did very well. He was independent, did all of his own cooking, cleaning, laundry, and finances. He used no walking aid and went to the Legion five blocks away every day without any help. In the hospital, an x-ray was done which revealed a pelvic fracture. His hemoglobin was normal, white blood cell count was 12.8 and lights were normal. No chest x-ray was done in the emergency room. He was seen by ortho in ER where they decided that there was no need for surgery. 
so he was admitted to non-teaching medicine with an admission diagnosis of fractured pelvis. On day two in hospital at midnight, he presented with a temperature of 38.5. He had crackles to the left base with decreased air entry. His white blood cell count was now 23.5 with a left shift. A chest x-ray was now done, showing left lower lobe infiltrate and effusion. Some clubbing was also noted. Mr. O was treated with oral antibiotics and refused other treatments. He went home on his own accord once he felt better. This is an all too common scenario for the geriatric population. The important principle that is missed here is that acute functional deterioration is associated with acute illness. This is the same with younger people, but often goes overlooked for the elderly and the acute illness will not be sought, as though acute functional loss is an expected part of aging. Acute functional decline also includes acute changes such as new onset incontinence, new onset falls, and delirium. This can often present itself in non-specific ways as well that may be described by family with phrases such as, mum just hasn't been herself. It's important that these concerns are followed up with a comprehensive workup with an eye to acute illness. So when we're talking about aging, what does aging mean? Well, it's a ubiquitous biological process characterized by progressive, predictable, inevitable evolution and maturation of an organism until death. Aging is associated with increased inter-individual variation. What we mean by that is if you took a room and filled it full of 40-year-olds and plotted their functional status on a continuum, most would be clustered around a midpoint with a few extremes on either end. If you did the same with a room full of 80-year-olds, the range would likely be much more spread out, with more people along each end of the spectrum. This is why it's so important when we're doing assessments and making decisions for geriatrics that we are basing it in part on functional status and not just age. And one of the key features that differentiates comprehensive geriatric assessment from a lot of the other models of healthcare is the importance of social environment. So we should always know more or less what our person's uh, economic status is in Manitoba a bit less than other places, but it's still very important. So being able to get 24-hour paid private care is very different than not being able to get 24-hour paid private care. In other healthcare systems where there's way less home care, this is even more important, what your financial status is. Secondly, what's your marital status and with whom are you living are very important. If you're giving care is important, or if you're getting care and who's getting the care. And often you see these sort of pairs of people who are both giving care and getting care. And that's not an uncommon clinical scenario of uh, two functioning paired people who are propping each other up. And that's very important to know about. We take one of them away and the whole thing collapses. Or you even let one decline and the other collapses. And it's very important. And it's also important to think that a lot of these people are 90, their kids are 70. That's important too. And when we look at who's giving the care, we like to think it's the sandwich generation, but equally important, if not more important, is actually the older population themselves. So the, one of the common caregivers is actually the old, oldest older, often looking after one another. And we often forget that, because most of us are, are in the sandwich generation. We tend to think of caregivers as us, but most caregivers are actually older people themselves. Then what are the existing functional limitations and projections for the future? Um, the other important thing is the recent losses. So a lot of older people are dealing with chronic, chronic grief. So friends are starting to die, family are starting to die, pets are starting to die, and all those things are important. That said, it's a remarkably resilient population, and most people actually do trudge on pretty well through, through these losses. Then there's individual res resources and risk factors, and then it's not just who you get hands-on support from, but who you get emotional support from is also important. We know that functional assessment is integral to a geriatric assessment. Let's listen as Dr. St. John explains why. Functional status is important, and functional status is the ability to perform ADLs that you need to. There, depending how you cut it, two or three domains, IEDLs and ADLs, and then maybe mobility. And why are they important? Well, one is they're important for identifying diseases. So you don't get functional impairment just because, you get functional impairment because you're sick. And chronic diseases cause chronic functional loss, and acute diseases cause acute functional loss. 
So it's actually important in diagnosing diseases. Secondly, it's important in prognostication. We spend a lot of time developing prognostic models and almost universally the strongest predictors of outcome is your functional stat. So if you're uh, an insurance company predicting healthcare expenditures, predicting somebody's life expectancy, you really would want to know their functional status and their age and gender. And you could probably stop there. You may not even want to know how severe their disease is. Uh, so it's a very strong prognosticator. Related to that, it should be an aid in selecting treatments. Now, we shouldn't discriminate against disabled people, but we should use their functional status to guide appropriate treatments. The other thing is we should use functional status to monitor progress. Right? And we do this on the inpatient units. So previously we would use the concept of plateauing and the, the subjective opinion of the team. Now we're using the subjective opinion of the team plus functional status measures like the FIM. And so we should say this person's progressing and getting better. And if they're not getting better, why aren't they getting better? So it's important to monitor the progress of their disease. The other thing we should remember is that often functional status lags a couple of weeks behind their medical status. So we shouldn't get too impatient if they're still not walking because it may lag a little bit. Um, and then the other important reason if you wear administrative hat is increasingly people are measuring performance um, without looking at functional status. And if you're going to adequately adjust length of stay and things like that, you really have to know what the functional status of the people is because the nuclear powers in length of stay are social networks, cognitive status, and functional status. And those are never looked at in administrative data. Functional status is dependent upon your disease states. And the more diseases you have, the more functionally impaired you are. And the other important point is that they interact. So one plus one isn't two, two plus two isn't four you get interaction. And one of the classic ones looks at the interaction of osteoarthritis and ischemic heart disease on walking speed. One of the key points from a medical perspective is we have to abandon this idea of parsimony of diagnosis. So in medical school, one of the first things you're taught is Occam's razor, right? That the single logical explanation that, that explains it is likely true. And this is if you, do any of you watch House? Yeah, this is the classic Occam's razor, right? Like someone comes in with 25 symptoms and he labels it down to some bizarre, obscure disease. That's not the way the world works. Mm -hmm. Almost always you've got 10 symptoms with 20 causes. Okay. We really have to get away from a unisystem, unicausal model into a polysystem, polycausal model. And that's actually very important. The second important point is that we do need a multidisciplinary approach, or I guess now the interdisciplinary would be the appropriate term approach and it has to be multidimensional. So I won't rant about failure to thrive except to say that this was a stupid idea that nobody hears about anymore. It used to be a social admission and then people studied the mortality of social admissions and found that the mortality of a social admission was higher than the mortality of an MI. Mm -hmm. Then they went to this idea of failure to thrive and people looked at the mortality of failure to thrive and found it was higher than the mortality of an MI. And now we have dyscopia. <laughs> so how many of you have already heard the term dyscopia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where have you heard it? Emerge. Emerge. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the stupidest goddamned idea that ever exists. Well, except for failure. If it weren't s the long history of this stupid concept, it would be a bit more excusable. But when we have 60 or 70 years of this idiotic idea that just keeps coming back of the of dyscopia, um, and there was a recent paper in, in Age and Aging, which was really nice because it's not universal to Winnipeg. It's not to slag Winnipeg. And it's in, in the UK, there was a paper that said acopia. And they looked at the mortality of acopia and found that the mortality of acopia is, you know, 25%. So these people are, are discoping with being sick. The problems with the concept of failure to thrive in dyscopia is difficult to define. And most importantly is it promotes intellectual laziness. And we don't go looking for the cause of their not coping. And we have to go looking for the causes of their a coping. And I, most families expect this, right? Like most families bring their family in because they're not coping, expect somebody to look at why they're not coping rather than just slap a label on their forehead and pretend that there's no problem.